Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My guest today is Andrew Morantz. Andrew is a staff writer for The New Yorker. He's written extensively for the magazine about technology, social media, and the alt-right topics he explores at length in his newly released book titled Antisocial Online Extremists, Techno-Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation. For several years, Andrew was embedded in what were effectively two symbiotic worlds. The first was what he calls the gatekeepers of Silicon Valley, who we commonly think of as the Facebooks and the Googles of the world and their executives and employees. And the other was what he calls the gate crashers. And these are people like Milo Yiannopoulos, a celebrity troll and lightning rod for woke outrage, or Gavin McGinnis, an internet shock jock who happens to also be a co-founder of Vice Media. These are people who many of us may not know, but who Andrew contends exercise as much power over shaping the national conversation and driving the news cycle as some of the most deft propagandists operating in mainstream media today. This book is not easy to categorize. It's not a book about social media algorithms. It's not, in other words, like Zuboff's surveillance capitalism, but it does cover this, certainly with the chapters on techno-utopians. It's also not a book about politics, though, again, politics is central to the story. I think it's really not about anything. There's no argument being put forward. It's more like a series of reports from the front lines of the online culture wars told through the stories of all these different characters that Andrew embeds with for what must have been three very torturous years of his life. And we talk about this. We talk about what it was like for a Jewish reporter from a liberal magazine to spend time with what were, in some cases, legitimate anti-Semites and neo-Nazis, and in other cases, just generally not particularly likable people. So this was challenging for me as well. Because it's hard to get away from the viscerally unpleasant experience of reading about some of these people. And that's a way of saying hang in there, because we do muddle through some of these anecdotes during the middle of the episode before we get into what I feel is the best part of this conversation, which is a discussion about race relations, gender norms, the masculine appeal of guys like Joe Rogan to people like me. And what that says about what might be missing in popular culture that attracts both men and women to alternative media, and in some cases, to subversive elements of media. And that conversation goes well into the overtime, where I also share some personal anecdotes. I know some of the people featured in Andrew's book personally, in some cases, extremely well. And I probably watched hundreds of hours of videos put out by Alex Jones, David Icke, and all of these different characters that will pop up on your YouTube feed. Because like many Americans, I lost faith in our government, not only after watching CNN and MSNBC and Fox sell an unpopular war on false intelligence, but also watching how both the Bush and Obama administrations handled the bailout of Wall Street, which was how I got totally red-pilled and went down all of these various rabbit holes. So I think it's important not to discount the legitimacy of the paranoia that drives people to consider all sorts of radical theories to fill the gap left by these institutions and their narratives that have lost so much credibility with the electorate over the years. So 
I hope you all enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Andrew Morantz. Andrew Morantz, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great having you on, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to get into it. I mean, it's funny, you so know. So are you in therapy right now? <laughs> <laughs> Are you I'm working good. with a uh, post-traumatic stress physician? You know, my wife is very, she's unaccredited, but she's very patient. She's unaccredited. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's a lawyer. So she's, but you know, we have a lot of blue pilling sessions in my house. Oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's another cool thing about your book, all the different idioms that arise from the internet, yeah. whether it's, you know, being red pilled or whatever, we'll get into those. So I told you, I read the book. <laughs> it's quite a book. How are you sleeping now? You know, we'll get into the experience of reading it, but before we do, maybe you can give us some context. How did you decide, I, I believe you did it, actually you did a great interview on the Long Form Podcast with someone who is your cousin yeah. by marriage or something, yeah. right? And he said this could have been called How Nice, the subtitle could have been How Nice Jewish Boy from Brooklyn Got Caught Up with <laughs> Hanging Out with, <laughs> with the worst people with, on the uh, white supremacists yeah. and Nazis. So how did this happen? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, basically... So I wasn't one of those people who went in being like, who are the craziest, scariest, darkest, you know, people on the internet? Because I feel like there's almost a danger of sort of turning them into antiheroes in that way. Like you're like looking for Breaking Bad or something. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to romanticize it. And I didn't want to overestimate their importance. You know, a lot of these people, people who are propagandists and trolls and, you know, they'll often try to inflate their importance because they want to seem big and bad and cool. And, you know, sometimes they're actually not that influential. Really, my way in was like 2014, 2015. I was just very curious and concerned about what the internet was doing to us, to our brains individually, but also as a society and as a polity politically. Mm -hmm. And so I basically, I had a couple moments of this kind of like dizzying feeling where I was like, okay, we have this notion that there will be these traditional structures of media that people will know what they know because of sort of getting it through official channels. That was never entirely true, but it had just become so much less true than it had always been. There used to be Walter Cronkite. There used to be a kind of gatekeeper apparatus mm -hmm. that was extremely imperfect and had lots of flaws. And I try not to be too nostalgic for some golden age that never existed. But when I really looked at what social media was doing in terms of chopping up and rearranging our national psyche, I went, we might be screwed here because there's no common arbiter of fact anymore. There's no common arbiter of decency anymore. And so because I'm a long form immersive reporter, because I don't like to just do arguments and polemics, arguments and polemics are fine. I read them. I like them. But I didn't want to spend 400 pages going, this is why social media is bad and scary. I wanted to get in there and see it for myself and do some observational reporting because I feel like opinions only get you so far. And seeing it for yourself, watching how these people operate, how they interact with each other, how they look when their mask starts to slip off, that's the only way we're going to actually move forward and re-describe the world to ourselves as it really is and not as we want it to be. I have a bunch of quotes in my rundown of yours that I liked, as well as quotes of some of the more dislikable characters like Milo Yiannopoulos or Mike Cernovich. But there's a quote of yours that either was from the book or was from the press kit where you say, Something was happening and I was trying <laughs> something was happening and I was trying to figure out what it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And so I mean that's kind of like all of us, right? Because I think this is a, a shared experience, irrespective of where you're coming from. Most people are just trying to figure out what's happening. And I don't even mean it politically or I mean it culturally. What's happening culturally? How is this all changing? When you went into the book, when you went into the research for the book, you said you tried not to be biased, but you were unapologetically biased in a way, mm -hmm. which you actually talked about in the book. But you mentioned you didn't want to kind of go in looking for this kind of anti-hero. But what was the thesis that you went into the book with? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're totally right to say, first of all, that culture and politics can be fused into this one thing. And I think it's sometimes dangerous for us when we see politics is over here, culture's over here, business is over here, media's over here. One of the thesis kind of concepts that I went into the book reporting with was to kind of that those distinctions no longer applied and that actually all these things were really blurring. Mm. And in fact, if those things were blurring, then the political outcomes that people were predicting might not make much sense, right? Because you remember in most of 2015 and for that matter, most of 2016, 
everybody was saying, well, you know, Donald Trump is this cultural figure, but he's not a political figure. You know, we can't take him seriously in that arena. Mm. He's a he's a reality star. You know, he's a, on The Apprentice and stuff, which to me, it was like, OK, again, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that people are going to vote for who they see getting endorsed in their local newspaper. There's quite not, the opposite. Quite the opposite. endorsement can be toxic. Exactly. But <laughs> but and, and also they might just not see it. Right. So much of it has to do with what are they actually seeing and paying attention to? Where is our attentional energy being drawn to? And that, you know, this is one of the great insights of Andrew Breitbart, who was a despicable guy in lots of ways, but who was a, a media savant who saw way ahead of time, you know, he died in 2012, but he kind of prefigured a lot of the people in my book. And his great insight was politics is downstream from culture. Hmm. And of course, the stream goes in both directions, but to see it in that direction was a real insight at the time. And so he knew that even though Donald Trump wasn't a conservative and didn't know anything about politics, of course he could be president because he's a celebrity and he understands how the intentional ecosystem works. Now, if you put that, that's true enough in the age of mass TV and mass media and top down mm -hmm. gatekeeping. Once you get to the fractured media landscape that social media creates by chopping everything up and turning it into algorithms, it's even more the case that someone like Trump could take over the political system. Mm -hmm. And that was, I didn't want to go in with preconceived notions. I had my own moral compass mm -hmm. and I had my own fidelity to truth, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to go in with sort of factual presumptions like, oh, well, you know, I'm from the New Yorker and what the New Yorker does is really, you know, heavily fact checked and heavily reported. There must be a place for it to succeed on the internet. Well, you can look at the numbers and see whether it's succeeding or not. And actually a lot of times the like, garbage bottom of the barrel, you know, racist meme -a sphere was out competing the New Yorker when I looked at it. So that was not a pleasant thing for me to realize because I don't like that fact and I'm biased in favor of my thing because I think it's better than the garbage on the internet. But I didn't want to be biased in the sense of not seeing the facts for what they were. So sticking to this point about bias, there's a point in the book where you're on the phone with Mike Enoch and that's a pen name. He was doxxed at some point. And Mike is sort of the quintessential neo not Well, I guess Richard Spencer- Enoch is kind of like the house philosopher of the online Nazi movement. Yeah. He kind of puts the words in Richard Spencer's mouth in a lot of cases. Fascinating. Well, he's a guy that grew up in the suburbs in oh, New yeah. Jersey. His parents are both progressive. They're both horrified by his transformation. But there's a scene where you're talking to him on the phone- where he realizes that you're Jewish. In fact, you're eating a bagel and lox. And you thought he asked you what you're eating for and you said you held back because you you assumed he knew you were Jewish. I assumed he knew. And I honestly also based, I, on, based on just the obvious fact that you're <laughs> I have a Jewish name. I have a Jewish face. I have written for Jewish publications. Like, come on, man. I was like, if your job is to be a professional anti-Semite right. and you're constantly bragging about your Judar, as he called it, Come on, I'm not that hard to spot. So that's what I kind of wanted to say. So I wanted to commend you on the way in which you navigated this in the book, because you are a Jewish reporter working for a liberal magazine, talking to, in some cases, white supremacists and Nazis, and in other cases, just people you find generally dislikable, and that comes across. And I think you do a good job of owning that and you often do it stylistically by sort of breaking the third wall and speaking directly to the reader and having these honest moments where you're basically saying, hey, this is what I'm thinking and this is what I'm feeling right now because this is also a new experience for me. Totally. Yeah, it was a really tough line for me to walk, as you say, because on the one hand, you know, I don't want to just be arbitrary in my preconceptions. You know, I don't just want to say, oh, you know, I don't like you because of your shoes you're wearing or whatever. Like that would be bad reporting. On the other hand, when people consistently lie or say misogynist things or say racist things or just show some kind of like nihilistic glee at desecrating all the norms of the country that you live in, <laughs> you can't just look at that all with a sort of blank stare and go, I have no opinion about that. I am a neutral, unbiased reporter. And so therefore, Somebody who thinks that women shouldn't be allowed in the workplace is of no meaning to me. Like, of course, that has meaning to me and I hate it. So I think people get caught up a lot of times on this notion of reporting that's unbiased as if like reporters aren't allowed to have brains and eyes. And but yet at the same time, I didn't want to say, oh, you know, because I'm some latte sipping like oat milk drinking, you know, soy boy from Brooklyn. Therefore, the world has to be funneled through my vision. And if you step outside of my right. vision, I'm going to slam you. But, you know, I feel like 
we get so caught up in these things, especially now. And I mean, again, this is another thing that Trump has done to us as a society. Suddenly, you know, the media is getting slammed by half the country for being against the president when, yes, of course, sometimes that's true. But a lot of times they're just pointing out his obvious lies or his obvious corruption. And that's somehow seen as biased. So we got to get out of this thing where if you refer to unpleasant facts, you know, that's seen as bias. That's an interesting thing. You said what Trump has done to our country. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting way to put it. I wonder if that is accurate. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that came across in reading your book and also in reading other journalists is that there seems to be a perception among a certain class of academics, coastal, quote, elite, mm -hmm. people that go to, you went to Brown University, for example, you're mm -hmm. highly educated. It's no Wharton, but yeah. <laughs> it's no Wharton. It's, a, <laughs> it's a, actually in some ways a much better university, <laughs> but you have to be very self-motivated and mm -hmm. sure-footed. Mm -hmm. I also watched your commencement, was commencement speech, yeah, yeah, is that yeah. what it's called? That's yeah, funny. it was very, very good. Um, I'm sure your ago. teachers were proud of you. <laughs> there seems to me to be a desire somehow to kind of, simplify the problem mm. and say it's Trump or it's racism mm -hmm. or it's all these things and we just need to fix these things and then our country will move on and everything will be all right. Mm. That doesn't seem to be the case in my view. I yeah. think Trump to me just seems to be an expression, the apotheosis of something deeper. Yeah, I definitely agree with and, that. But, and but I, I would also say that these guys, these characters in the book, like Mike Cernovich and some of these other figures like Gavin McGinnis or Alex Jones, I think they're way more on the fringe, but they channel or speak to some of the concerns or sources of frustration or disconnect that many people in the country find relatable. Does that make sense? What do you think about that, what I just said? I have a lot of things I think about what you just said. I mean, first of all, if we could fix racism and fix Trump, I think it would do a lot for our country. I think there's, you know, like you said, people imagine that if we just fix racism, you know, we'd be able to move on as a country. I think it would be great if we could fix racism and it would help us to move on, but I don't. But I was suggesting that racism or latent racism or white supremacy are these pockets of of this type of whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it is part of a problem, but it's not the only issue or oh, isn't what's driving is. My yeah, point. yeah. I'm, I'm extremely clear in the book that it's not the only issue. And I go to great lengths to say that Racism is part of an interlocked, intersectional, if you will, stack of multiple problems. I also go to great lengths in the book to exactly refute the thing you just said about how once we get rid of one or two problems, our country will be on some automatic shining path to an inevitable future. That's, in fact, the antithesis of what I wanted to get across in the book. I think the whole point of the book is that the antithesis of some faith that we're on some automatic tracks to some inevitable future is a concept that I call contingency, which is really kind of the whole point of the book. Hmm. All right. So let's, we're going to circle through and around all sorts of stuff. I have, there's so many things that I've written down here. This is one of the most difficult rundowns to put together because you really could have written one book on just the deplorables. Mm -hmm. And even the deplorables doesn't capture all of them. The deplorables are kind of like the stunt doubles. You've seen Spaceballs. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, when Lone Star and his cadres are like running through the starship Spaceball One getting chased and then they end up in this room and it's their stunt doubles. Like, you idiots, right. these are not them. Right. We've captured their stunt doubles. <laughs> right. And so I feel like the deplorables are the stunt doubles. For who? For whatever the movie. It's like if you filmed the movie and you got the uh -huh, stunt doubles, uh -huh. you know, they're not- Because they're pathetic. But they're also below the bar. Yeah. They're beneath the JV squad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You totally, know what I mean? Totally. And, well, and, but what's so shocking is that even though they are the JV squad or below the JV squad and they're kind of bumbling and pathetic in many ways, they are way more influential than we like to think. I mean, I think part of what was embedded in your last question is sort of like, well, how much do we really need to be talking about these people? Because they're obviously so beneath our contempt. But yeah, that was yeah. an implication of and my question. To That's me, cool. it's like, well, yeah, I felt that way in the beginning of like, well, I don't want to spend too much time around these people. They make my skin crawl. But first of all, they're actually sometimes way funnier and weirder than you think. And second of all, and not funny in always an intentional way. And second of all, they're way, way, way more influential than we like to think. I mean, you could say the same thing about, you know, I don't know. It's hard to believe. I believe you on one level, yeah, right? Because I yeah. don't think you're lying. Yeah, right? right, right. Like when you talk about, again, Cernovich and you're actually in his home, which I, you know, is such a weird book to read because it's visceral. Yeah. Like it's viscerally disgusting when you talk about them. By the way, you also talk about the techno utopians. I think you're much probably more forgiving of them than I would have been. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But I find they- made, I was super hard on them. Yeah. That's like, interesting. Yeah. I think, well, I think- I think depictions of the deplorables were way worse. Huh. That might be because they're worse or yeah. worse in your view. 
Well, interestingly, to sort of stay on this point yeah. of visceral experience, yeah. the techno utopians, like when you're with Emerson Sparks uh -huh. in his office or when he's like talking about like remaking the future and all that stuff, it made me want to vomit. Mm. But that wasn't as bad as with the deplorables because there it felt like I was in some like, you know, the entrails of the internet and there was like crust and, you know, moldy piping and stuff all over me. By the time I got out, I just couldn't get it off me. It was I just, love that. That's the, that should be a blurb for the book. Cause that's the thing about long-term fly on the wall reporting. It's one thing to say, you know, I, I heard about these terrible people and I saw them tweeting and they're really bad and they shouldn't be on Twitter or whatever, but it doesn't give you that visceral sense. Like that was why I wanted to do it in this forum. So gross. And and there's <laughs> it's so gross. And the guys are grosser than the girls. And they feel oftentimes developmentally stunted. Their humor is very juvenile. Their humor that you express in the book is like caca, poo poo, <laughs> penis yeah, humor. Totally. And so like a lot of those guys, like the deplorables, for example, there's a distinction between them and the Nazis. They don't seem to believe in anything. Like a Milo doesn't believe in anything. Right. He was the editor of what at Breitbart and he's gay yeah. and he doesn't have any particular beliefs. Right. And his beliefs that he expresses seem to go counter to being gay. And also to the beliefs he was expressing like four years earlier. Right. So yeah. Yeah. So there is, I totally agree. There's this sort of whole spectrum from kind of pure nihilism, opportunism to actual sort of like committed ideologues among the kind of more white nationalist or anti-Semitic fringe. And again, with all these people, I mean, I totally, I wouldn't have just inflicted this on people if it was just 400 pages of gross out like oh my God, you won't believe the crazy, terrible things these people say. There's definitely an element of that. But I think of it as like, you know that book, it's like 20 years old now, Among the Thugs, it's about soccer hooligans. It's one of my favorite books. No. You would love it. It's a, I think everyone would love it. It's a very specific time. It's this guy who embedded for a few years with soccer hooligans in England because again, there was this question. I mean, it was pre-internet. It wasn't really political directly, but it was just a similar question like the quote you said earlier about something was happening and I wanted to know what was going on. I feel like that any book like this where you're sort of descending into a subculture like this, it could apply. And that was his, he saw a bunch of people come through a train station and just demolish the train station for no reason other than their football team had won yeah, or lost or whatever. They just like this group violence. And so he spends time with them for two years to try to figure out why. On one level, I was just sort of doing that. Like, who are these people and why are they doing it? But as you were starting to say earlier, if it had just been that, it would have been one very specific kind of book. And it would have been a kind of like tour through the circus of weirdos who live on the internet and who the internet has empowered. But it was very important to me to do the other threads of the book about what the internet fundamentally is and how it's built at a sort of mechanical level that makes this possible. Because without that, I did feel like it was verging a little too close to anti-hero territory where it's like, oh, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, they really ought to stop robbing banks. But, you know, look at them. They look like sort of dark and glamorous while they're doing it. I didn't want it to have that quality. I wanted it to have the quality of the reason we're getting to know these people is, yes, to understand and try to figure out their weird psychological quirks and their histories and their gender relations and all that stuff, but also to try to see systemically if we had a functional media informational ecosystem, these people would not be empowered in the way they are. And I really wanted to capture how empowered they are. And I know that creates a lot of kind of cognitive dissonance because they shouldn't be. So that's really interesting. The word power. This came up to me when I was thinking about this conversation. Before I, I express that thought, I do want to reiterate something I said earlier, but didn't, I don't think, mm -hmm. emphasize enough, which is really, you could probably get 500 books out of this book. Mm -hmm. For example, Samantha, there's just one chapter yeah. you talk about this girl, Samantha, and the way she became radicalized and became, I don't know what you would call her. So, you know, and that feels very parallel to a lot of the stories you hear about people that become radicalized in ISIS totally. or other terrorist organizations. This thing about power, this really sticks out to me because I wrote, again, in the beginning of the rundown, I talked about how they were. this book explores basically two things. One is the, how technology has changed the culture making process through we build a shared consensus view of reality. Mm -hmm. And the other was an examination of the various realities, mm -hmm. right? These little subcultures. But the one thing I don't think it examines that it doesn't necessarily intend to, it doesn't have to, but mm -hmm. it's something that I find very interesting is the power dynamic. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I come back to this point again and again, which is, are, do we really need to focus on these people, is they're not very powerful. You're saying they are. I'm curious to understand really how powerful they are. Mm -hmm. But the ones that are clearly powerful are the techno-utopians. Mm -hmm. It's the people that write the code, that run the platforms, that decide, right? I mean, you have this great chapter in the book. It's actually more than just one chapter where you talk about Reddit 
and the decisions that were being made at Reddit in order to decide what subreddits to ban and what not to ban. And this also brings us to a great conversation. Again, you could write a whole nother freaking chapter on this, which is where do we draw the line, mm -hmm. right? So let's maybe we can focus on both of those. We can talk about the line after, but let's talk about power. Mm -hmm. How do you think about power in the context of the work that you've done here? So there's lots of ways to get into it. And I agree, there are lots of threads kind of coiled around each other in this. And that was, yeah, I didn't want to resolve all these questions. I wanted to kind of have it be playing off each other in these ways that are kind of just provoke you into thoughts and some frankly worries sometimes without resolving them. So one way of getting at it that is just kind of pretty simple and not even all that political, you know, someone like Cernovich, let's take as an example, or someone like Lucian Wintrich, the guy who goes into the White House briefing room. Which you seem to like him more than the others or dislike him less. It's hard to say. I mean, he's way far onto the nihilist end of the spectrum. You don't get the sense that he believes anything he says. So it's like, all right, at least he's not a Nazi. But on the other hand, his kind of performance art is just all trying to troll the mainstream media out of any meaning or legitimacy at all, which... You know, I get why that's fun for people and I get why- I don't, it's crazy. Well, you call him Milo Light. He is Milo Light, yeah. And I get why, I mean, I, I have a little thing where it's like back in the day, you know, we all found it fun to just sort of like bash the torps on TV. You know, it's like really fun to look at CNN and be like, oh, you know, Wolf Blitzer, he's a tool, whatever. Like, you know, you just, because that is kind of the mainstream arbiter of gatekeeping that we all have. And it's fun to be anti-establishment. It's fun to be- oh, you know, you got something wrong or you don't get it. I mean, you see this every day with the New York Times or with CNN. And in a way, it's a fine national pastime because it shows that people are awake. It shows that people are skeptical. You'd rather have that than like North Korea, like, oh, everything CNN does is perfect. But if that becomes your entire persona, it just gets really tired. And like, so this gets me to the power thing, right? I don't think I've never been like a huge uncritical fan of the way mainstream media works. I'm kind of in it as a writer for The New Yorker, but I'm kind of also not because The New Yorker in another way is kind of this weird like little literary artisanal thing. So it's not like I, you know, write for The Washington Post or something. And even at those legacy print publications, print itself is kind of becoming a more relegated thing. So I have this kind of weird dual lens onto it. One of the things about power is we are so obsessed with the way that a story editor on MSNBC uses their power or the way a New York Times reporter uses their power, mm. which we should be. But also, their power is, as an individual, pretty minuscule next to the power of someone like Mike Cernovich, who actually can dictate on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, now you got me. So explain this to me, because I read it in the book, yeah. and I had a hard time scaling that up. Totally. Help yeah. me understand well, that. Help, it my, seems, help my listeners understand this. It really seems like it shouldn't be. It truly should not be the case that someone like Mike Cernovich is a more powerful media manipulator than someone who- Than Rachel Maddow. Right. And you know, there you could go toe to toe because she has a TV show, she has a built-in audience. But then if you start going down the chain, somebody, a reporter whose work is featured in a segment on Rachel Maddow, how about a segment producer at Rachel Maddow? You know, you start going down the chain. At what point do you hit the singularity point where Mike Cernovich is more powerful, more influential than that person? It's way sooner than you would like it to be. So. To break that, that makes down, sense, segment producer, okay. But in a way, that's insane, right? Because Rachel Maddow is one of the you know, 30 most influential people in mainstream media. Once you start going down that list, somebody who's credentialed, who goes to 30 Rock every day and has you know, 20 years of experience and has like the right kind of... Someone who is a legit member of the mainstream media. Well, is that the issue? Is it the issue that they're credentialed or is it the issue that Mike is just creating just falsehoods. You're just oh, it's, making It's things definitely up. the latter. There's nothing special about credentials. It's just that, and again, this is where I don't want to romanticize the act of gatekeeping. There's nothing about me intrinsically that thinks gatekeeping is cool. And I actually have this little riff in the book about how I'm such a reluctant institutionalist and I resent these people for making me stand up for people. Well, here's the quote. Of all that I resented about the deplorables, one of the most irksome qualities was that they forced me to think like an establishment shill. Exactly. There it is. So like that, I hate them for that because I used to think I was this cool, you know, anti-establishment, whatever. But at a certain point, it's like, the aesthetic catharsis that you get from being anti-establishment pales in comparison to the things that are being desecrated. Like, it's one thing if it's just like, you told me not to skateboard on that statue, I'm gonna do it anyway, like that's cool. When it comes to, okay, you told me to be nice to strangers, 
but I think the Statue of Liberty is bullshit and I'm going to just be mean to strangers and indulge my worst basis instincts, then I go, okay, it's no longer cool. Like now you're just being an asshole. Okay, so to explain the Cernovich thing, and yes, the thing that's worrisome about these people is what they do, not their credentials. But the credentials are a shorthand for saying, if you did half of the stuff these people do, your employee pass would be revoked at, at any meaningfully reasonable, reputable institution. We've seen some pretty crazy shit on the mainstream TV yeah. outlets. Uh, at last... Fox News, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Fox News for sure. Yeah. I've seen stuff that Rachel Maddow puts out that I think has veered onto the conspiratorial, but I agree that it's done with more, probably a bit more class. Yeah. Well, and this is the thing where, look, I've seen actually, speaking of Cernovich, I've seen him give a lot of talks, you know, his favorite thing to hit on. He gave a lecture at Columbia University about this. And there were lots of protests outside because why is someone like that at Columbia? We should back up and explain who he is. But yeah. <laughs> but his favorite thing to hit on is, well, the mainstream media makes mistakes all the time and Russia is a big conspiracy theory. And he's right. It literally is a theory about a conspiracy. It's just that when they're reporting on it, they're trying to get it right in ways that he's not. And they issue corrections when they get it wrong. And they, I mean, they are literally reporting on a Mueller investigation. They're not making stuff up. But like when you listen to the, to the media outlets, when I was listening to the whole Russia thing, one of the things you'd hear all the time is they'd say the Russians or Russians or Russians said right, Russians. And I the see. reason they kept saying this because they didn't have some material to back it up. They had to use vague language. Right, right. Now that whole thing, I don't know. I, I think well, the we're digressing a little bit, but the again, the media. What right. even is the media? Right. Well, it's kind of meaningless at this point, and it gives people who are media insurgents or meta media insurgents exactly. much more fodder. Because, and again, we should not take these things at face value. We shouldn't take anything on faith. The more these categories break down, and this is, by the way, exactly what the GRU wanted, and it's exactly what the IRA wanted. They wanted, well, I don't, you don't want me to say Russians, so I'm using specific <laughs> acronyms for the institutions that Putin uses to try to destabilize our view of truth. This is the goal. The goal of the Internet Research Agency is not to get us to believe everything they put out. It's to get us to disbelieve our own yeah, eyes and ears. sure. Anyway. So division and skepticism right. and doubt. Absolutely. And, and there should be skepticism, but again, there's a, you know, I did a TED talk where I tried to distinguish between smart skepticism and dumb skepticism. I love skepticism. I literally like my whole thing in college was studying how to be a better skeptic. But there's a bad way to be a skeptic and to just sort of say, well, everything I don't like is a hoax or a conspiracy theory that, again, you know, the book isn't about Trump, but we live in this moment where we have a president who just says climate change is a hoax because it's inconvenient for me. That poisons the discourse. So, OK, so to explain who this guy Cernovich is, and he's one of, as you point out, dozens of people in this book. He tweeted right before the book came out. I hear there's a book coming out about me and the thesis is that I'm mediocre. And I was like, actually, bro, the book's not really about you. But <laughs> I didn't say that. I just subtweeted him in my mind. But he um, <laughs> he's a very interesting guy. He's not a dumb guy. He's not like a 14 year old troll in his mother's basement. He's a guy. He's about 40 when I meet him. He lives with his wife and kid. They now have two kids and a dog in Orange County, California. And the reason I went to him and to the whole series of other people that I ended up going to is that I called it a reductio ad absurdum, meaning, again, philosophy concept. A reductio ad absurdum is a thing that it points out how the premises you were beginning with were flawed in the first place. So our premise is we have built up this informational ecosystem, and it's going to basically show us what's real, what's true, what we need to know. And the fact that someone like Cernovich was, in my view, one of the most, you know, 100 or 150 most influential Twitter accounts leading up to the election of president How, of the what, United what, States. What number? I would put him in the top 100. Uh, there was top a, 100 of the most influential Twitter accounts that the president of the United States was following? No, 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 no. Leading up to the presidential election. Are it, you serious? Yeah, well, because it doesn't matter who the president is following. First of all, the president doesn't read very well. Second of all, it's not about who he as an individual is following. It's about who is going to get the him press elected. Is, the press is following. Who the press is following, who influential activists and voters are following. How do you quantify that? It's very hard to quantify. And actually, there's an MIT study that didn't put him in the top 100. It put Bill Mitchell in the top 100 and this account 10 GOP, which turned out to be a front by the Russians that was a fake account that was run out of Moscow. So there are multiple candidates for this. And then other accounts that are like the official handle of Ted Cruz or the official handle of Fox Business or whatever. So one of the basic points is that whether you love it or hate it, it's just a mix of everything now. The way the algorithms have chopped everything sure. up there is no system anymore. It's designed to be, you know, there's this chilling Mark Zuckerberg quote, and maybe one of the reasons that it didn't shock you as much, the stuff I did about the techno utopians is because it's more familiar now. But if you really think about what they're saying, I quote this thing from 2010 where Mark Zuckerberg says, 
we're going to rebuild all information around relevance. Mm -hmm. And what's relevant to you, you know, a squirrel dying in your front yard might be more relevant to you than people dying in Africa. Yeah. That is a sociopathic way. It's a great way to run a business. I mean, it's a phenomenal way to run a business. That's why it did so well. But it's a sociopathic way to run a civic informational organ. That is not giving people what they need to know. It's the exact opposite. And it's all based around emotional engagement. So people like Cernovich, Bill Mitchell, all these people that I'm mentioning, they know how to hijack people's neural circuitry to get them to pay attention to stuff. Which is exactly what Mark Zuckerberg does. Yes. And Emerson Sparts and all these people. That's why they all deserve to be in the same book. Right. I guess my point was, and maybe this was my own bias, mm. because the reality is like we live in America and in America... We have there are certain objective metrics of success, mm -hmm. you know, and you can dislike someone, but if they've made a lot of money or if they have a lot of power, on some level you respect them, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, or you respect them more than let's say someone else, and it's very difficult to respect the deplorables, mm -hmm. right? But in some ways, the deplorables are, are doing much the same thing that some of these other people are doing, but they're just super successful at it. Mm -hmm. They're way smarter. Mm -hmm. Some of them are worth billions of dollars, and a good example was something like Emerson Sparks, where his company. All he was doing was exploiting the Facebook's algorithm and helping companies to exploit it and just make money off of that. Mm -hmm. You're just basically siphoning attention off the internet. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I've had a few people say he's the most despicable person in the book, actually. But they, That's it, interesting. Yeah. It's all a matter of, you know, I try not to signpost, okay, here is the person who you have to hate sure. the most. And I think it's cool that people have different ways of reading it. I think that's as it should be. So to, to put a, a loop on uh, the Cernovich story. So he, I try to go into everyone's backstories. I went to a tiny town in Illinois where he's from and you know his dad works on a junkyard there. His mom never finished high school. Like I try to get into these people's backstories and their kind of weird personal lives. His wife also worked at Facebook and got a bunch of money in the IPO. So all of this stuff is extremely intertwined. At the same time that his wife was paying his bills, he was having this kind of anti-feminist awakening and saying feminism is enslavement and I'm reading a lot of Nietzsche and he's telling me to be an ubermensch and all this stuff. You're shaking your head. It's a little bit sad, but it's real for people when they go through this radicalization process. I wanted to reflect. I didn't lose my moral compass into being like, again, with the neutrality thing. I know how I feel about this, but I wanted people to have enough of a sense of how it could feel real to someone. Yeah. So... He ends up being this iconoclastic anti-feminist blogger who, through learning the tricks of trolling and attention baiting and all these things on the internet, builds his own brand and comes up in 2013, 2014 through Gamergate and all these other things to become, you know, you talk about entrepreneurial success. I mean, he's not Mark Zuckerberg, but he, he takes these things that really should be relegated to the fringes and pushes them into the mainstream through the sheer force of his will and frankly, a weird disgusting kind of talent. So that kind of brings us to a question I have to kind of get it off the personal mm -hmm. for a moment, mm -hmm. which has to do with masculinity. And mm -hmm. I do want to go back to the feminine also because the women in these movements are a very particular type. Mm -hmm. You could really sort of identify them. They have characteristics. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm curious about that. But And we should do the gender thing. I just want to make sure that I convince you and your listeners about his power because up until this point, it does seem a little bit sad, like beating up on the guy who, you know, never quite figured out how to make an honest living or whatever. How much was he making? Well, he was making, he said a lot and he would send me bank statements and stuff from his books. He has this self-help book for men called Gorilla Mindset that's just basically like, you know, I mean, whatever. It is what it is. And that's partly because of the Amazon algorithm. He's able to hijack all these algorithms. He's able to hijack the Amazon algorithm to sell books. He's able to hijack Twitter and Facebook to push memes into the mainstream. And the point is, by the time this is all his backstory, by the time I get to his house in Orange County, California, I'm able to sit next to him in his living room and watch him go, OK, it's Hillary versus Trump. I want Trump to win for all these reasons. And my reasons might be more high minded and I might be worried about Hillary being corrupt or whatever. But I know that that doesn't get people at their emotional core. So I want to create an association between Hillary and disease or disgust or fear or terrorism. And I would watch him just day after day sit there, open up his iPad and go, OK, I'm going to do a Periscope video. I'm going to live stream to a bunch of my, you know, 2000 of my followers, just the hardcore inner circle fans. We're going to talk in the comments. I'm going to talk. They're going to type back at me. We're going to come up with a hashtag. Once we agree on a hashtag, we're going to go post to Twitter. That hashtag will trend. Once it trends, all the journalists will see it. It'll get on the Drudge Report. 
From there, it'll leap to Hannity. From there, it'll leap to CNN. And then literally, I would watch him be able to do this with such ease. Like in, every day, he in could an do hour, this. He was multiple, doing this every day. Multiple times a day. I mean, he would do four or five he periscopes was, a day. So these guys were driving the news cycle, is your point. Constantly. Like to the point where I would wake up and read the newspaper and go, this news story has Cernovich's fingerprints on it. Like to the point where I wouldn't have believed it if he had told me, wow. I would have been like, oh, this is swagger, this is bluster, but I watched it happen. So that's what I mean by power. Nobody's credentialing him. And if they knew, frankly, how they were being manipulated, they wouldn't be playing into it. But because he's been able to reverse engineer these algorithms, no one had to give him that power. He just takes it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I read the book. I believe you, yeah. but I don't believe it. It <laughs> shouldn't be. It it's one of those things. It should not be the case. Yeah, and I think this book is actually a really important contribution to this to this attempt to figure out what's happening. Right. You know? So do the masculinity thing because yeah, that's important. Because I think it's interesting and it's something, this thing again to what's happening. And I wonder to what degree there is a repression of or an insufficient roadmap for men mm -hmm. and for masculinity. You know, I have a certain idea of what masculinity is. I don't need that to be someone else's. But I, I feel like in our culture today, a lot of what I think is masculine, I often feel like I'm being told that that's bad. Mm -hmm. That's a, a very common theme that I have with my friends or a feeling that I have with my friends. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of these guys are tapping into that. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're not masculine. This isn't masculine what they're putting forward. But I feel like there is a crisis of masculinity. And one of the things that I thought about as an analogy is like in the Odyssey, when all the men leave Ithaca to go to fight the war in Troy. Mm -hmm. And what happens to Ithaca as long as Odysseus is gone, as long as the king and the men and the fathers are gone, the boys become suitors and they become rambunctious and they tear up the castle. I do feel like there's a crisis of masculinity. And so I feel like I see this in a way with these folks. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's an interesting set of things. So I worry about a crisis in masculinity and particularly in white masculinity in the sense that it leaves people vulnerable to all kinds of radicalization. I guess my emphasis might be less on worrying about people, you know, demonizing it or, you know, saying it's bad and more on sort of a deeper in a similar way that, you know, I think you were accurately saying that Trump is kind of a symptom, not a cause. I think a lot of the ways that sort of the superficial discourse around gender stuff feels kind of corrosive or degraded is a symptom of a much larger cause of how our entire national discourse is corroded. So I do worry that there's a, a crisis in masculinity, but I wouldn't lay the blame at the feet of, you know, people who are doing, you know, calling out so-and-so for for stepping across a line. I mean, obviously that stuff can be excessive or whatever, but I would put it more at a deeper level of just like, how did we arrive in a place where feeling a certain type of identity affiliation is the only thing people have in their lives that feels meaningful? How can we create like a better sense of meaning production other than I can bench a lot or I can fight a lot or I have a lot of guns or, you know, all these sort of like yeah, weird phallic yeah. substitutes. Mm. That feels like a crisis to me and it feels dangerous. And I know it's dangerous because I've seen a lot of people, both men and women, but there's, you know, specific to each identity, get so worried that they don't have anything in their core that they just follow these fantasies. I mean, literally the most debunked ideas in modern history start to seem appealing to them. You know, when you are a white kid in your teens and you don't have anything to feel allied to spiritually, intellectually, morally, civically. And then, you know, for some percentage of those kids, they're going to see whiteness and maleness and a kind of just a narrative that's being told to them that you don't have to apologize for anything. You're actually, the secret is that you are actually supposed to inherit everything without trying and that the people who are withholding that from you, be they feminists or Jews or whoever, they're the real conspiracy. They're the real enemy. I worry terribly right. about well, that. Well, that. that is something you cover in the book and that's a real issue. I don't know how big of an issue it is. That's a different question I yeah. have, which is really how powerful are these folks. And is that even really the question? Is it how powerful they are or is it because of course the Nazis weren't powerful until they came to power or right. it didn't happen overnight? Right. This thing about you know, the vulgarity, for example, mm -hmm. another common thing, you mm -hmm. know, the vulgarity mm -hmm. that these people deploy. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, and the same thing, the vulgarity that you see on the subreddits, it feels like that's also a sort of a reaction to something being suppressed, some kind of aggression that's being suppressed or something. Maybe it's also an accumulation of 
the failures of a large cohort of, of society that can't get a girlfriend, that can't get a job. I mean, that's a huge part of it as well. But let's take Joe Rogan for a minute. One of Joe's appeals for guys like me is that he represents much more of the traditional masculine archetype that I'm familiar with. Like when he talks about girls, when he talks about sex, when he talks about fighting, that's something that I find relatable, mm -hmm. you know? And I wonder, and I, I'm curious what you think about this. It feels like on some level, though it's not perfect, women have progressed in to fit their new roles better than men. Mm. Women seem to have, because for women, I don't know if there's a similar assault on femininity because for women, it's like, how do I balance being feminine and being a woman, a traditional woman and being a mother with now being an empowered career woman, which is something I want. Mm -hmm. And with men, it's really unclear. You know, those dual roles aren't really clear. It's not clear, certainly, that men have accepted the other role, which is not really clear what that is. Mm -hmm. And of course, women don't find that necessarily sexy. So there seems to be some kind of, I don't know what the word is. I don't Attention. Want to use, I, don't, I don't want to use crisis. There's something that's not working in our society around gender roles. I see. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally get the appeal of Joe Rogan's show. I listen to it a lot. There are parts I like better than others, but I get the appeal. I guess society keeps changing, right? And the internet is supposed to be this thing that just reflects all changes seamlessly because it's supposed to be the case that when we bring somebody together, this is where the techno-utopianism comes in. When we bring people together, when we allow voices to flourish, there's this assumption that it's all going to kind of work itself out. And that assumption was always flawed. So the reason that the book is called Antisocial and the reason that the subtitle is Online Extremists, Techno-Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation, the online extremist is just one little part of it. The techno-utopian idea that tells us that the national conversation is going to keep growing towards some shining future. It's going to, the arc of history is going to keep bending toward justice. That was always a flawed idea. And that was the techno utopian idea that, look, yeah, gender roles might be changing and it might be confusing for people, but let's just throw all these voices out there and they'll find a way to coalesce. And that didn't happen. That's not happening. So, in terms of whether the way to solve that is to go back to hunting with bows and arrows in the woods of Los Angeles County or whatever. Fascinating that that has taken off as yeah. a thing. Or whether that is just a weird throwback thing like hipsters, you know, playing records and it's all just sort of play acting and, you know, trying to get at something that's a little more ephemeral or whatever. I think that's what it is. Sure. But the point is the internet's not going to iron out those wrinkles for us. We have to do it ourselves and it's a lot harder than it seemed to be at first. And so all these people like Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey who are trying to just throw the gates open wide have this widespread marketplace of ideas and just outsource the difficult part to the marketplace of ideas to work it all out. We don't even have a marketplace, an actual financial marketplace that just works stuff out on its own. So why would the marketplace of ideas work this stuff out on its own? It's interesting. You know, the question also is how does culture change? Mm -hmm. You know, like in the 1960s, for example, there was a huge cultural shift. Mm -hmm. We did have television that played a huge role. Mm -hmm. But how much of it is ideas and how much of it is, you know, it's unclear because in some cases the momentum, you know, there are guys, for example, that aren't going to change, right? And they're a certain age. They're not going to change either. Their ideas aren't going to change or they're economically set in their ways. Mm -hmm. So it's really not clear to me how cultures change. But do you feel this thing that I'm expressing this kind of, again, I don't want to like use the word crisis because I'm not sure if that's the right word. But this thing, you mentioned it. I mean, like bow and arrow shooting animals in yeah. the woods, right? I actually think that a lot of what we're experiencing is, sure, there are people who aren't going to change. But again, the reason that I'm harping on the national conversation element of this and the reason that so much of the book is actually not about individuals, there's a lot about individuals in the book. But when I come to sort of the conclusive stuff and the threading throughout it, it's much more about this notion of cultural vocabularies and a mm. cultural discourse. The reason I do that is because my theory of kind of how history changes is not about great individuals showing the way. My theory of how things change or how things are constituted is about systems. And we're embedded in systems of thought that, sure, there are individual lags and lapses, but there are people who you never thought, and we all know people like this, who we did not think were going to be okay with same-sex marriage. And then within a space of eight or 10 years, it just became a thing that everybody had to be okay with. 
and they might grumble about it, but they keep the grumbling to themselves and they're more ashamed of it now than they used to be. And I'm not saying shame is always a good thing, but it's not always a bad thing either. Well, that's also a great example because gay rights has moved at a lightning pace. It's crazy. This is why I talk about the Overton window so much in the book that we're used to thinking of Overton window shifts. Tell our audience what that is. It's a concept of, and it's related to the concept of cultural vocabulary. It's, It's a concept of what is acceptable versus what is controversial versus what is unthinkable. If it's unthinkable, it's outside the Overton window. But the Overton window can move. That's why it used to be unthinkable that two people of the same sex could be married. Now it's basically unthinkable that any politician would oppose it. Now, we like to think of it going in that direction because that's the nice direction. But my point throughout the book is that it can shift in any direction. And we like to tell ourselves, going back to what we were talking about earlier, these people are so fringe. They're nihilists. They're misogynists. They're whatever. They're Nazis. Why are we talking about this? This stuff is unthinkable. But as you point out, the actual Nazis, it was unthinkable until it wasn't. Yeah. So I'm not saying that we're going to fall to some fascist dictatorship tomorrow. What I'm saying is we got to be aware of the directions that our vocabularies are going in and not just have this blind faith that they're always going to go in the right direction. Now, the reason I started talking about Overton Window stuff is that, yeah, gender roles are changing and the racial makeup of this country is changing. And I think that creates a lot of tension and a lot of fear in people, particularly the dominant people who see it as a loss. But my larger view of the crisis in masculinity and the crisis in whiteness is that a lot of this stuff is driven by, yeah, you know, you're losing some of your power and that it's going to be messy. It's going to be personally painful in a lot of ways. But I don't see that as a departure from some golden age. I see it as a departure from oppression, frankly. See, I think you just nailed something that I wasn't really conscious of. I think I dispute the idea, or I hear this a lot, this idea that white people were the dominant race in America for so long. And that now they're they're becoming a minority or they are, they're not yet, they're going to be, right? Mm -hmm. And that a big part of this just reflects the change in power dynamics Mm -hmm. between races. I feel like that that actually misses the larger point, but that's not where the power is. It seems to me that there is a, I talk about this in the rundown in terms of dispossession. There is a dispossession in the country, but I think that has much more to do with education and wealth Mm -hmm. than it does have to do with skin color. Mm -hmm. In other words, what I see is that we have the biggest gap in wealth since the Gilded Age. And I think a lot of the people that, let's say, watch Alex Jones or Tucker Carlson or whatever and are angry, I wonder to what extent are they angry because they think that some guy who is darker skinned than they are is getting a shot at their job? And how much of it is because they feel increasingly like they're screaming at a screen and they can do nothing? And there's a certain class of people that's getting wealthier and wealthier and they're setting the rules and they're setting the, the, the norms of discourse and they feel increasingly powerless. Sure. I think that's totally valid. I guess the question then would be why is that populist rage being channeled into Tucker and Alex Jones instead of into Bernie and democracy now? It's a great question. So first of all, you highlight Cassandra Fairbanks in the book. She was a Bernie supporter. Mm-hmm. And then she flipped and became a Trump supporter. That's an interesting phenomenon too, right? That there were people that were on, on the oh, Bernie totally. side and then went to and the And a Trump lot of side. these people, I mean, nobody's born alt-right, right? This is a new thing. A lot of these people come from the left, most of them probably. So how much is the support of Trump? How much is Trump's support a reflection of people that are because Trump doesn't have any ideas. He was a Democrat. Right. No one thought of Trump as a racist until he became president. Well, he was well, a racist. Well, I guess some people that knew about what he, his buildings in yeah. Queens or right. whatever, but like most people didn't think about Trump like that. Mm-hmm. That wasn't his brand. Right. But that's because we're suckers and we fall for branding instead of paying attention to what he said all along. He's an empty vessel, isn't he? Does he have any ideological beliefs? I think he's been a racist the whole time. I don't think he's been a very effective one. But Well, you could say, what's it called? When uh, Pep Buchanan described Nixon, he described him as a country club anti-Semite. Right. Right. Except that when he was in the, in the <laughs> Oval Office, he stopped talking like he was in a country club. We have a lot of tapes of him yeah. being a very not country club anti-Semite. Yeah, no, he was disgusting. And it's so t- is Buchanan. Yeah. So the thing is, these things have been accepted. You know, you talk about the Overton window. We again, we tell ourselves this story of the American exceptionalist myth that, oh, a white supremacist in the White House, that's unthinkable. It's actually unthinkable that we've had anything but white supremacists in the White House. It's happened like three times. That we've had anything other than white supremacists. Right. Like, what do you mean? Who? Well, everyone up through Woodrow Wilson was proud of it. Right. I mean, it was just part of the country. he's famous for it. Right. But I mean, just also historically, it was just part of the country. Sure. And it just obviously- But what about like Bill Clinton? What about George Bush, both senior and junior? Yeah, those would be the three. And Obama. And Obama. 
and because you're saying Reagan. But here's a good example. The Bushes were elites, elitists. I mean, right. they were way more powerful than Reagan. Oh, they weren't great people. Yeah. And I guess I'm just, I don't know. And they I'm, were all, they all played racial politics in ways that I think we would and should find disgusting now. I mean, Sister Soldier, all the stuff Bill Clinton did, locking up more black men than any other president in history. I mean, no one's hands are clean in this. I'm just saying, it's just weird that we're surprised by this stuff. Right. And George Bush Sr. had the- he, the Willie Horton. The Willie Horton guy yeah. up in Boston. Yeah. Right? Andrew, stick around. Yeah. We're going to go to the overtime. I'm doing my best We here. got a lot I, more I to talk I have interrupted about. <laughs> you way more than I normally do. And no, I'm, this is great. And I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure, man. Yeah, I want to get to all the stuff on your pages. It, it's all great. I'm really excited. I want to continue this conversation because this is actually the meat of what I find most interesting. For regular listeners, you know the drill. If you're new to the program, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces, where you can gain access to this week's overtime, where Andrew and I'm going to continue this conversation. There's also a link in the description to this week's episode that you can click on that will take you to that page. You can also get access to a transcript of today's conversation, as well as the rundown, which Andrew, Andrew, what do you think of this rundown? This is I'm you, loving Andrew. It. I, I, you. Did you see that's you? That's not me. That's no, my cartoon. Well, this is you, but this is you actually right here. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got to check this out. This is, you put a lot of work into this, man. Yeah, man. This is Adam Driver in, uh, what was the movie again? Black Klansman. Black Klansman. And there's David Duke played that, by whatever his name was. Dude, I would love, I mean, that, <laughs> that is like my dream to be that character. So you can get access to the rundown as part of the Super Nerd subscription or the transcripts are available to Autodidacts and Super Nerds. And everyone has access to the overtime, including a link to the RSS feed that you can put into your favorite podcasting applications and listen to this just like you listen to the regular episode. Andrew, stick around and we'll be right back. Yeah, let's do it. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at Creative Media Design Studio in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.